All right, everybody, we got our guest here. Kelly Earnhardt Miller has joined us today on the Dale Jr. Download. Kelly, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, we got a lot to talk about, I know. First off, uh, how are you uh, handling quarantine and everything going on over the last month? How's you and your family doing? Well, we're hanging in there. Uh, the kids are bored out of their mind. Um, I've got uh, one doing school, and it's only taken them an hour to do his schoolwork. So I'm a little concerned why we're going to school for eight hours or six hours. And my uh, daughter, uh, has their, her school has not scheduled schoolwork. So um, they're getting a little antsy, but we're doing okay. It's uh, getting some working from home and doing a few things outside and getting some more quality time together. So you can't complain about that. Yeah, I've, um, <clears throat> I've really, really enjoyed uh, being at home a lot. And, um, you know, as someone who's traveled a ton in, in over the years and, uh, even even now with my new job at NBC, um, this has been um, a lot of fun for me. Just spending a lot of time at home, and uh, I can imagine. I mean, you do got to get creative, and uh, I kind of like that challenge too. But um, have you and, and your your you know have you and LW and the kids all gotten along really well? Is the tension high in your house? Uh, what's what's the what's the temperature? It just depends on what day it is. Um, so uh, the the temperature was really good until my daughter Kennedy came home from California. Uh, for <laughs> she's been living with her dad for this semester, and um, uh, something she wanted to try. And so we kind of had our rhythm going on, you know, me, L. Dub, and and Wyatt, just uh, the threesome there in the house. And uh, so she's come home, and and it's been a little challenging at times. But you'll have that. She's a teenage girl, so. Uh, those out there with teenage girls will totally understand that. And Dale, you'll understand that one day. Mike Davis, you'll understand that one day. I'm starting to understand Matt, it now. you too. <laughs> I'm starting to understand Earlier, that. I think. Yeah. Yes. It starts I'm, earlier these days. I am starting to understand it now. And one of the things, I mean, because I've got a fifth grader, and I'm curious with you. I mean, I know why at school work, I wouldn't expect to be too challenging. But right now, I'm having my own fun trying to figure out fifth grade math problems and that kind of stuff, because now she's into fractions and stuff. Has anything from the schoolwork stumped you? I mean, here it is. You run a company, and, and, and you know, we're all supposed to be smart people, and yet nothing can be more humbling than struggling over your kid's schoolwork, or if they tell you what the answer is supposed to be. True. Well, we're only in second grade uh, with Wyatt, so it's not very challenging. Uh, you know, we're doing some, I don't know, eight-letter spelling words and, you know, writing sentences and doing uh, – double digit math and things like that. But uh, yeah, nothing that stumped me yet. But um, when Kennedy gets started, I, I can uh, probably attest that that'll be difficult. And uh, I know a lot of parents are out there struggling um, because either, either they're trying to do it online with their kids or they're trying to teach their kids the concepts and different things. And, and the schools are all doing it very differently. And some kids I know are, are really, you know, six to eight hours a day, which sounds astounding to try to if you're a working parent, if you're in the healthcare and you're still working, or if you're trying to work from home and you're juggling the noise and all the different things you're trying to get done, you know, yeah. it's, it's the juggling. Yeah. The juggling is, <laughs> is very hard yeah. to work and, and teach them and entertain them. It's yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, well Kelly, you have, um, you know, you're heavily involved in the day to day at junior Motorsports, overseeing pretty much every aspect of the company, uh, from top to bottom. And, um, nobody better than you, I think, give us a real understanding of what these teams are going through through this process is as we sit around and, and hope for the uh, virus itself to, um, to improve and the, uh, the state that the country is going in, uh, the state that the country's in right now, we hope for that to improve. It's also had a huge effect on businesses and, um, you know, NASCAR is not immune to that. The companies and the, uh, the teams are not immune to that. So talk about that a little bit about what kind of challenges that junior motorsports is facing right now to maintain, uh, you know, whatever they can until they can get back to the racetrack. Yeah, you know, the first week, we've been out of work now three full weeks. Um, and uh, so the first week for me was like real emotional. Just, you know, anytime there's unknown, there's fear thrown at you, you're not sure, you know, how you're going to uh, do your job when you can't do it the way you've always done it, right? But since then, three weeks later, it's just like doing this podcast. Uh, you know, we figured out ways to communicate, ways to do things. I think the folks that are struggling the most are um, 
you know, our actual mechanics and the guys that go on the road and the crew chiefs and, and the actual competition department of motorsports because they can't really do anything. And they're all itching to, to be working on race cars. And I know from conversations that we've been having with the crew chiefs and, and some of those folks that that's been really difficult for them. Um, their home life is probably a little crazy too because their wives and kids aren't used to them being home. And, and while you want the extra time, it's a different dynamic when they're there all the time. So, um, you know, I've just heard a lot of different things from them. Um, and, you know, for the most part, we're chugging along and working. Uh, it's been a struggle to figure out with not knowing when NASCAR is going to race again, how long does this problem exist and, and how long can we keep things in play like we're trying to do and, and keep people paid and, and all of these fun things that, um, you know, as a business owner, you have to think about how far is your cash going to go, what's your cash flow look like and different things like that. So uh, we've been, you know, looking into doing all kinds of Excel spreadsheets and things like that, trying to, figure that out but with the unknown of when we go racing it's really difficult to kind of figure that part out with um with the opportunity of you know fox or um you know i racing to be broadcasting events on saturdays and and sundays um there's some small opportunity there for uh your partners to get a little bit of uh, exposure um, how seriously are the teams addressing that, uh, accepting that opportunity? Um, where's JRM, uh, you know, kind of fit into that category of using this, this sort of unusual method of, of creating exposure and engagement with fans? Yeah, you know, um, it's, uh, that's been a great opportunity to, to have our racing and, uh, I was, laughing yesterday at OW who's sitting on the couch watching the rest of our race and he gets up and he goes I can't believe I'm sitting on the couch watching a computer race you know <laughs> uh, and then he goes right back to the couch and sits down and and it was about 16 laps to go and and uh, I was trying to get him to get up and do something and he's like no there's only 16 laps to go <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question though yeah it's a great opportunity to uh to try to plug and play your partners you know on the cup side I think with the drivers um uh, most of the drivers that are in the series are running their sponsors, which makes a lot of sense. And for us having uh, you doing the racing, uh, we can, you know, pull partners and do different things with you uh, where it makes sense. And then uh, Justin Algayer and his partners, you know, so um, we can give some love to the other people that are uh, associated with junior motorsports too. But, you know, the rest of it kind of works the same, the social media engagement and the marketing pieces of it and the fun things and creative things that you can come up with to, uh, to, to try to, uh, engage the fans, uh, you know, works no different than when we're on the racetrack. Um, and, and when you're watching the race on television, so it's just kind of figuring out those, uh, what do you call them? Liveries, not paint, the, the paint schemes. I call them paint liveries. schemes. Yeah. The liveries. Uh, and, uh, Mike Davis had to explain that one. The word liveries. Yeah. I use the word livery, uh, just because I know it's probably going to get under somebody's skin. I don't really love that word either. Paint <laughs> schemes is what I like to use, but, um, you know, this is, uh, it's, it's funny because this whole thing's thrown everybody, uh, for a loop and we're all having to get creative on how we communicate and, and, uh, um, how, and, and, and the iRacing thing has, you know, been a nice blessing. I know I've been a huge, uh, supporter of, of that, service and talking about it all the freaking time but uh it has been nice to to have that as a bit of a way to deliver to our our sponsors and um give them some content some sort of interaction engagement with fans uh kelly um you know you've been in some of the discussions with uh you know with with nascar on on their plans and and what is nascar doing what is the sport doing as a whole to help our teams or to help um, kind of keep things in order and, and, and keep everybody positive about, uh, about, about the future. Yeah. I mean, you know, essentially they've just said, you know, reach out if, if there's anything we can think of that we need, um, uh, you know, but I think they're kind of holding information close to the vest in a sense in terms of, uh, you know, dates because they don't want to get anybody too hopeful. Um, you know, I was just saying to someone last night, this, this scheduling thing is going to be very difficult. Uh, I was listening to um, uh, Trump say that the NFL schedule, they thought that, you know, they would go off on key in August. 
And the California governor said, not in my state, um, you know, we'll listen to this, this, and this, and this, and decide if, if that's appropriate. So, you know, you're going to have this federal government thing, you're going to have the state governments and all this kind of stuff playing into uh, what NASCAR, and I think NASCAR is just standing by, kind of taking it all in, not trying to get ahead of it, um, you know, really listening to uh, whomever their, you know, officials are that uh, are giving them the, the, good, the best information that they can, and we're just all kind of trying to take their lead, but um uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really, really hard to be in a holding pattern. It's uh, really difficult when this is what you do and this is your life. Thank goodness. We have some other facets to our business like dirty my media and, um, you know, some other things that, uh, kind of can take your attention away. And I've got something big going on. Yes, you do. You yeah, got a right. big... <laughs> yeah, we, we, we wanted to get to that, uh, part of the conversation. So now's a good time. Yeah. Today is you. the day. You are, uh, you are officially uh, going on Just bookshelves an author. and an author. Yeah. Yeah, an author. So first off, um, you know, tell us the name of the book. Tell us where we can buy this book. That's most important. Yeah, right. So it's Drive by Kelly Earnhardt Miller, Nine Lessons to Win in Business and Life. And uh, if you go to kellyearnhartdrive.com, uh, there's all the information that you need to know on, on uh, the different outlets that are carrying it. I said it's going to be so difficult um you know amazon's going to be your friend because obviously online shipping uh, i think a lot of the bookstores are doing online shipping too so bam and barnes and noble and places like that um we're doing copies as well on shopjuniornation.com so people can go to our website but um this is I, i've really fretted up until this day of the book release not because i'm nervous to be releasing a book but under the circumstances of everything that we're um facing is uh you know i wasn't sure what to do, but, um, my, I have a feeling that people are reading perfect. more books now yeah. than, than usually any other time of the yeah. year. So this may be a blessing for, for authors like you coming out with new material. Also, there's no, aside from the physical copy of the book, the online orders as well. Yeah. Um, have you always wanted to write a book? You know, you, you've seen, I've have had a couple book opportunities. We just recently did one, uh, but also did one years ago earlier in my racing career so you've kind of been able to watch uh, that, you know, that that sort of in close proximity play out. Um, is is writing a book or being an author about your story? Because there is a lot of personal information in this book about your childhood and so forth um, that I think is going to be awesome for people to read. Was writing a book something that was always in the back of your mind, or is this something that come around over the last couple of years? Yeah, no, I've really never thought about writing a book. And um, to be honest, it was a conversation with your book publisher um, uh, in one of our meetings that uh, she looked at me and she said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I said, well, you know, not really. But, um, you know, if I wanted to talk about something, this is what I would want to talk about. And, and you alluded to uh, a lot about growing up in our childhood. And really, it's kind of the relationship with our dad um, that I speak a lot to. And for me, um, I never really thought about putting that out there, but, um, you know, through years of, uh, feeling like, not that I really knew I was making the mistakes then, but in my, in my relationship with LW, I knew that I did not want to have another failed marriage, um, when we first met in 2010. And so I started going to therapy, uh, in, you know, a couple of years into our relationship with our kids and having a blended family. There was just lots of different reasons. And when the, the reason that we went to therapy first was for one of the daughters. And then I ended up in my own therapy, which was cool. Um, and, uh, I think everybody in the world needs therapy. That's just my own personal opinion. We all got something that we need to talk out and work through. Um, and so kind of going through that process is really, um, what led me to thinking that, now's the time and it's okay because it's kind of putting a bow on my healing process and uh, my, my thoughts and experience. And I was nervous about, uh, you know, our dad is an amazing individual. I, I can't, you know, stress that enough in terms of um, uh, he, you know, he accomplished so much on the racetrack. I mean, we all know it, right. And I mean, he, he had a heart of gold, uh, the relationships that he had with most everyone in his life were really positive relationships, but he really seemed to struggle being a dad and he really seemed to struggle with the relationships with his children. And, um, and that's what I wanted to talk about, you know, is for, for part of my process. And so that's what I share 
And that was really difficult um, thinking about talking, uh, you know, for, for somebody that the fans love so much thinking about and speaking about him in that way. But I think that they'll find it, um, that they'll, I think they'll understand, especially if your parents, you get it. You know, I think it's, um, it, it's nothing that's, you know, too negative. It's just my experience. And that's, okay. yeah. you know, I can talk about that. So tell me, you, you know, I, I know that I've read the book and I've gave you, gave you some feedback and I'm sure LW, your husband has read the book and gave you feedback and other people close to you. Um, who has read the book? You don't have to really give me a name, but you've, you've had to have had people read this book that are outside of that circle of trust uh, to give you some more genuine critical feedback on just what you were concerned about, the intimate details of your childhood and your relationship with Dale Earnhardt. So yeah. who, what has the feedback been from, the, from what you would perceive the, you know, the every man or the, the, the neighbor next door that's going to buy or read this book? What's the feedback from that person been like? Most um, of, you know, that, that really don't know the story um, have said that they feel it's very respectful. They get it. Uh, a lot of people have said at the time that we were being raised, this was kind of the way of parenting, right? We're in a <laughs> whole new age of parenting uh, these days. And, um, you know, that, you know, this, the way that our dad parented and the discipline, now I think it was a bit extreme, but the discipline that he uh, imposed on us and some of the different things that, uh, that we experienced. Um, you know, so many people just say that was kind of the way it was and, and they yeah. remember their own fathers being that way or their father's fathers being that way and things like that. But, um, I haven't had any negative feedback out the, 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 the true test I think will be our race fans, those loyal Dale Earnhardt fans that get a different, um, uh, get something different that they, you know, that, it's not been touted about him being a father, right? So they know him as a racer. They know him as a badass racer. They got all these descriptive, great descriptives for him. So th they'll be the true test. To see I can I him. can give you mine. Uh, you yeah. and I haven't talked about this, and I don't know where I fall into that category that Dale speaks of, but I'm going to tell you, the first time I read it, we were sort of in the uh, process of which we were looking for typos, right? Kelly, you <laughs> yeah. gave it was a manuscript. And so I didn't read it on the personal level in which it's written. I read it from a complete editorial type thing. When I read the book, you gave me a book and it was really special and you had a nice sweet note in it and I, and I really enjoyed it. And, and I read it again and my God, how personal it gets right off the jump, man. And, and, P, and, and so here's my takeaways. First of all, it's not a, it's not a racing book. And also I wondered – uh, you know, how are you going to bridge the gap between having such uh, detail to your childhood and the issues that you're carrying and then making that business? But it makes sense, or I'm sorry, in, in making it a business book, nine lessons to win in business and in life. And the, and the, and the reality is, is that you can't not tell that beginning part if we're going to understand who you are and how you evolved into the business person that you are. Secondly, I felt like there was a moment in the book where your dad got it we just hadn't been able to see it. And it was when he sent you flowers at college. It made me even tear up because he missed you. And I thought that this is a very human moment in which you're seeking a relationship, like a deep personal relationship with, with, with someone that you haven't got it from. And that moment that you got the flowers was, uh, it was touching and it was a very human. And I think that opened up into what's buried within the tough exterior that, that everybody knows is Dale Earnhardt deep down. We knew that that's what you'd been looking for. Now it just didn't seem to come out a whole lot and you had been looking for a lot more. The one part I will say that blew me away and, and it blows me away probably because I was around for it. I just didn't know it. And, and that was the, the issue that you would have had in the DEI situation when your dad's gone. You're now taking over Dale Jr.'s business in the complete change of dynamic in the conversation that happens in the conference rooms at Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, which up until then, nobody had Dale Jr.'s voice. Nobody was looking out for him. And now there's an advocate for Dale Jr. And that person is you. Man, I, I, I could feel the tension in the room just reading the book. Like, 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? I can't yeah. imagine how awkward it was yeah. when it's like, they're just not used to having somebody go, no, that's not what we're going to do because it's <laughs> not in the best interest of Dale Jr. Yeah. That takes somebody strong, uh, courage. I mean, the dy- it just, and, and, and now it could really process to me because of what I had just read. Yeah. In, in the childhood and how, how the, the, the role you had to play, the glove you had to put on your hand to now do it in this new job was extraordinary, difficult, extraordinarily difficult. And I can't even imagine being there in real time. Yeah. There's two things I want to address that you said, you know, one was, um, you know, the story about the flowers and really, so, you know, that happens when I'm in my third year of college and which I'm probably 21, 2021, uh, 20, because Dale came to my 21st birthday at my new apartment uh, in Concord when I moved home, Um, but 20, and so then we lose our dad at 27. Um, I do think, Dad, you know, we have a younger sister, Taylor, who's 16 years younger than me. Um, Raising her, I believe, you know, gave insight to Dad where opportunities that he missed with us. And I do really believe that he was working to kind of forge those relationships and, and different things like that. And, and, you know, Dale, uh, going into NASCAR and, and that was really great for their relationship because they could bond over something that, you know, uh, they could talk about and do. So I really do think that that was coming and then we lost him and we just didn't get that opportunity. You know, we didn't get that opportunity to make amends. Um, And, you know, Dale, uh, the DEI stuff, you know, dad was Dale's advocate and, and that was fine with Dale. I mean, Hey, sure. It was all going really well, you know, of course, the Dale dad could be the voice. Um, when, uh, you know, he needed to speak up with Teresa and I think, you know, that's obviously what we lost. I mean, that's what we lost from a family standpoint, from a business standpoint, was that voice, um, to kind of be that liaison between everybody and Teresa and dad. And, um, and so, yeah, I stepped into that role and, and, um, which I kind of had always uh, been that person right now. <laughs> yeah. That was the lunch room or military school or. <laughs> yeah. But Kelly is the, the fact that uh, again, you put, you put so much detail into the way the, the weeks and months leading up to, uh, February, 2001. And the fact that you had a baby and he, you know, where he's showing Carson around, is yeah. uh, is so moving, but you had some stuff some stuff left unsaid when he died. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah that that's something to carry for the rest of your life, and I can't imagine is easy. Do you feel like you've hit no? Is is knowing that he was making amends in places has that been enough to kind of get you at a place of uh, of forgiveness or at a point where you can move on with it? Yeah, you know what helped me the most was going through therapy and realizing that, you know, the way he did things was just the way he did things. And he didn't have anybody else telling him any different. And that's what he thought was okay. I can remember stories that um, my aunts would talk about Ralph, their dad and, and dad's dad. And, you know, how he was just, I mean, he was a hard nosed father. And so that's what my dad lived under. And then, you know, we have dad and, and, and a couple of different marriages and a couple of different kids coming out of that in different, different situations. Um, and so what I learned through therapy is just, that's okay. And what I learned is that that's, I wanted mine to be different. You know, I wanted my relationship with my kids to be different and understanding that. And so that's how I'm okay with it. Really. There's, there were le- things left unsaid that really bothered me for a lot of years, but giving him grace and giving him that understanding that, that's just what he knew, you know, um, that you really, it's, it's hard to fault him for it and be angry about it when, after you go through therapy and you kind of see how the minds work, you know, and how it all goes. So, so Kelly, we, um, you know, I think we all would really appreciate you being so open and honest about that part of your life, but the book is about your success as a businesswoman and, and your approach to, um, um, you know, how you, how you handle and approach your business, uh, and your professional work. So give us a little bit of an insight on what readers are going to learn or what, how they'll be enlightened by that particular part of the book. I mean, it is, you know, the book itself is, uh, about, you know, nine ways to be successful in your, 
in your profession. So tell us those, you know, tell us what's going to enlighten the fans when they read this. Yeah. You know, I think everybody will see the relationship between um, the first part of the book and, and the time that we spend in talking about that and the nine lessons to win in business and life, right? Because they're all things that kind of stem out of, of just my experience. You know, I can't really say it any differently. Being authentic, being approachable. I don't know about you, Dale, but I feel like, you know, a lot of our life was lived um, where we maybe had to be something that we really didn't want to be. I mean, you went through years of dyeing your hair and rebelling and things like that, you know, because we were, times it was like we needed to conform to a certain thing, right? Being uh, the kids of Dale Earnhardt. And, um, and so being authentic, being approachable, you know, being approachable is very important to me uh, through my relationship with my employees. Um, and letting them know that uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'll do the same job that I asked them to do. If they need something, come to me. Sometimes it even bites me because uh, they'll skip their supervisor and come straight to me. So uh, sometimes I can be a little too approachable, I guess. But, um, you know, and I talk about letting go to move things forward, customizing your communication, kind of knowing your audience, who you're talking to. I think that's really important. Um, I talk about aiming for the win-win. And that's a lesson that I learned from dad. Uh, in, in, um, in life was really, you know, that, um, uh, a win-win is really needed when you're working, especially in our business with partners that, that they get something out of it. We get something out of it so that we can kind of forge a long-term relationship. But, you know, I talk about managing your emotions and balancing work and life. So they're all kind of applicable, um, lessons that, uh, you know, kind of make sense when you read the whole thing. But, um, and, and Mike can, Mike, Leah, Matt, they can all, they can all attest to whether it's true or not. <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> well, listen, when you talk about approachable, that to me means I can literally holler from my office out to your office. And even yes. when I'm not hollering, you still pretty much hear everything I'm saying because I'm not the quietest person, but you are extremely approachable. Those, those things, it, when you read that book, they all make sense to us as employees. I hope that that is the situation for people to be able to um, understand that who are not your employees because that's th th because I think that there's some really good lessons that people can apply um, even if they do run a staff like they yeah. need to they need to understand that like this is a leadership book yeah um, I think you know it's a lot about just relationships with people right all of them can be kind of applied whether any kind of relationship so it can be a family relationship personal work business a partnership you know uh, b2b whatever it, just, any kind of really relationship it's what it all boils down to, doesn't it? I mean, when yep. in everything is relationships, people want to be treated well, they want to be treated fairly. And then the, the but also you want to be treated fairly in that there's an expectation uh, for somebody that has a job, there's an expectation for you to fulfill it, you know, with your best possible, uh, you know, talents and whatnot and skills. And if you don't, then there's a, uh, there's, you know, there's repercussions for that. But I think you, yeah. I think you're extremely fair. And um, I mean, it's a fantastic book. I mean, people need to get this book. And there's no better time to do it than right now because I think there's a lot of life lessons that uh, can be applied anytime. Yeah, really good um, uh, time to read books for sure. I've been I pulled out a few myself that I want to try to get through. But uh, you know, um, I I really think that even if there's just one nugget that someone gets at, you know, that my book is not you're not going to read this and then like go out and just be Mrs. or Mr. Successful, right? There's just something in here that will probably, you know, tug at your own heart or your own mind. That's something that you can put into play um, that works for you because everybody leads differently. Everybody's success is, looks different. And, right. um, you know, so, so I just want people to understand it's kind of my experience and, and um, you know, s hopefully there's a nugget in there that uh, they can learn. Well, I really think you did a great job putting your book together Thank and you. I'm really uh, excited for you to be, um, to receive the feedback from it. It's really going to be more than, than you can imagine. It's going to be more to you than you even know. Um, when people come to you and say exactly what you just said, this is, this really stood out to me. They're going to bring to you the book. They're going to bring to you stories about how it's affected their lives or how they've taken that nugget or or this piece and, and applied it to themselves. Yeah. You're going to love that. You're going to love that experience. Seen that from your book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, You're going to love it. It's just, uh, <laughs> yeah, you are open and honest and, and transparent. And, and we, we love that about you. Uh, and I'm hoping that also, like you say, 
not only is it going to help some people, I'm hoping it helps you, hoping it gives you some, um, some satisfaction. So, well, they say close the book. Yeah. On that whole situation. <laughs> well, hopefully like you write, it hopefully you yeah. write another one, you know, hopefully we'll it gives see. you, yeah, hopefully it gives you some motivation to, to do more, but, um, we appreciate you coming on today and yeah, for having me. Hopefully, hopefully everybody at home stays healthy. And I know that you are also, um, you know, we can't thank you enough, Kelly, uh, as, as a few of the employees here on this show. Um, I think we speak for all the employees at junior motorsports in saying that we really, really appreciate your leadership and the, the tough decisions that you've had to make throughout this process to keep this company afloat and to keep us, to where we can continue whenever that happens uh, going back to the racetrack. So um, from everybody at Junior Motorsports, we are just so thankful for your leadership. You are so tough and a little bulldog, and uh, <laughs> you just do such a great job at, at leading our company. So um, er everybody is, is, you know, I know everybody uh, doesn't have a direct connection or direct line to you maybe in these, in these times, but um, we can speak for them and tell them, tell you that, um, you're just so appreciated. So well, thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you for coming on and uh, yep. enjoy your, enjoy your week. I'll be All in right touch. guys. Thanks so much. Appreciate All it. Right.